next one in the series of Radical Anthropology Zooms. And tonight we are welcoming a, a truly radical anthropologist, uh, Professor Felix Padel, um, who we have had uh, speaking at, at RAG before, um, but we're very interested to hear on, on this subject, uh, anthropology of intelligence agencies, studying radically up towards an anthropology of intelligence agencies. Um, Felix holds various posts, has written many books um, on his work in connection with Adivasis, East Indian Adivasis, um, especially in relation to the aluminium industry and their struggles. Um, and um, he is, has been Professor of Rural Management at Indus Indian Institute of Health um, in Jaipur. Um, as well as visiting professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. Um, so Felix, let's hear from you. Thank you so much. Um, it means a lot to me to, to speak to you. I, it, it's a daunting subject and um, you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to speak to maybe as much as half an hour. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to hold up books because the luxury of speaking at my home is that I can actually show books. So this one is about how intelligent agencies like the CIA impact and have impacted and continue to impact many, many indigenous people. Mm. In the Vietnam War, this is a very well-known example. So I'm going to give maybe 50 book references like that. You can write them down as I hold them up. Um, I can give them afterwards. And I'm also going to mention some other books that I haven't got or newspaper articles. And I want all of your references too, please. Um, so, in my first book, to introduce a little bit where I've come from, um, which was also my PhD, I studied reverse anthropology of the administrators, the missionaries and the anthropologists and how they impacted a tribal people in India. So studying the power structure is sort of what I do. And then with Samarendra Das, this book I wrote about the Adivasi movements against the aluminium industries. So the subject, I feel very diffident approaching the subject. I'm not an expert, but I'm like all of us, intelligence Im agencies impact us and it's a vast big jigsaw that we all know different parts of. Um, and I think it's very important as anthropologists, we do study up and we don't neglect to study the intelligence agencies because obviously they're studying us. And as with anthropologists, we've decolonized our subject. They're still going on trying to do that. And it's, a, it's a, an uphill and very vital struggle. And it's important, you know, good people in intelligence agencies do the same thing. There are many well-intentioned people in them and they become, need to become very conscious of their role and need to know that, you know, they are under the spotlight. Can you hear me okay? No, that's because I have to take it off because, you know, there's a limit. But anyway, I mean, everyone's supposed to register in Delia. And yes. I don't know what's going on, but anyway, let's study. Shall I carry on or is it? Yeah, hard Chris, to um, I'll try to, to shut Chris up. He's talking over you. <laughs> Please That's carry okay. on. We can hear you. So, in a way, um, st the starting point of looking at intelligence agencies is also to look at what is intelligence? What do we mean by intelligence? And sometimes, what intelligence agencies do, if you go to the, the history of them, like, one can talk a long time about the history of spies, but in Britain, obviously, during Tudor times, it's generally agreed that they became much more organized. And one of the um, bits of literature that really represents this to me is the play Hamlet. Hamlet is almost a play about surveillance. And Tom Stoppard's takeoff of the play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. It's about intelligence agencies, the role in honey traps and assassination and so on. It's a, it's a long history, obviously. And I'm not going to go into the history more than that. I'm going to start it straight away at the Second World War. Um, in the Second World War, all of us in Britain have grown up on stories about our heroic 
spies and our brilliant um, intelligence agents and what they did at Bletchley Park, in a way, they won the Second World War. And some of the books about this, um, Ben McIntyre is a very good writer, Double Cross, like all of the Nazi spies operating in Britain, were, were captured, were some of them executed, but those that they could were turned and made into double agents. So that's a, an excellent book about that. His other books, um, Agent Zigzag and um, Operation Mincemeat. Operation Mincemeat, for those of you who don't know, was turned into a film, The Man Who Never Was, in 1956. And it was a, a dead body. They found a Welsh tramp in London. They dressed him up in a uniform. They put letters on him to make, make it appear that we were going to invade Europe from Sardinia and Sicily would be only a, a false attack, but actually Sicily was the main one. And these letters got to Hitler. He was persuaded, he withdrew a lot of the troops from Sicily and the invasion of Italy succeeded. So vast deception and very, very successful. That's just a kind of background to understand. I'm gonna go very, very fast over this history. Um, then. In the Cold War, if, if our spies were, were, in a way, they, they beat the, the Nazis. And that was also because the Abwehr, which was one of the main um, Nazi intelligence agencies, was actually riddled with people who were very anti-Hitler. And they almost wanted Hitler's war to fail. So um, that's another very interesting history. Um, but while we were doing that to the Nazis, the Russians, the Soviets were doing it to us in the sense that the Cambridge Five were already in place and they were relaying a lot of the main intelligence secrets to the Soviet Union. So after the war, the Second World War turned almost immediately into the Cold War. And um, this infiltration took a long time to be discovered. And what happened with the Cambridge Five is very interesting because um, Don, uh, Donald McLean was a very, very aristocratic and influential spy in charge of uh, intelligence against the Soviets, but he was actually a KGB agent. So he managed to escape. So did Kim Philby, but quite a few years after. Um, and of course, these people became classic traitors in a sense. But then when the last two of the Cambridge Five were discovered, John Cancross and um, Sir Anthony Blunt, who was very close to the Queen, they were debriefed in the 1960s, but they were allowed to go on living in civilian life because it was too embarrassing to out them. Maybe a little bit like sort of the discourse going on now about Dominic Cummings. It's people who are too powerful and it was too, um, embarrassing to expose them too much. One of the other influential ones was George Blake, who was said to have been turned when he was um, imprisoned in the Korean War. And he was so shocked by the Allied bombing of Korea that he became a communist. And, and then he was finally imprisoned. He was a Soviet agent, 1956 to 61. Then he was imprisoned. He was sent to Wormwood Scrubs and he managed to escape brilliantly and escape to the Soviet Union. You know, these, these are stories that many of you will know, but they still have a kind of impact. And then, of course, Gordievsky and the whole history of Soviet agents defecting, British agents defecting. Really, the, the complexity of the Cold War spies is, is a vast subject, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, but one of the less known aspects is Operation Paperclip that involved about 1,600 Nazi armed scientists being given reprieve and taken to the United States. Others were taken to Russia. Um, another book called Annie Jacobson has written a brilliant book about Operation Paperclip that's very hard to get. And one of the people, it also involved Nazi spies. So especially Reinhard Gettlen was, had been in charge of the Nazi intelligence services in Eastern Europe. And he was, um, taken on by the CIA and he formed the Gettlin organization. They used his contacts throughout Eastern Europe and then he was instrumental in 
forming the German secret um, agency of the um, West Germany. So he was director of that for 12 years and he written a book about it um, called Service, uh, Memoirs of uh, a, a German General. So um, again, that's about all I'll say on the Second World War, except that another aspect that is not often looked at is the whole issue of Gladio. And one of the best books about that, um, Daniel Ganser, Operation Gladio, NATO's Secret Armies. So Gladio was, it managed to, through dirty tricks, campaigns really, in Italy, Belgium, France, and other countries, it stopped communists coming to power. And of course, its influence in Turkey was especially strong. Now, um, moving on again to understand more what, what spies have got up to, because those spies, the extent of deception, the extent of infiltration of other governments and so on that happened during the Second World War and Cold War, where, it, where has it gone now? You know, we know a lot more about spies in that area than we do now, in a sense, except when spies come and actually speak to the public on the BBC or something. I'll come to that. So one of the things that, especially the CIA, it, everybody knows they've helped effect about at least 70 regime changes in countries since the Second World War. And to go into a few of those, um, Britain was particularly involved in getting the socialist Mossadegh out of power in Iran in 1953 through, again, very dirty tricks. And it's something we don't like to remember too much, but luckily some people keep reminding us. Then Guatemala, the next year, 1954, what's particularly interesting about that, and Adam Curtis and Mark Curtis, two brothers have written and made films about this, that Edward Bernice, the father of PR, was involved in that, in painting the deposed Arbenz Guzman leader, democratically elected leader of Guatemala, who was a socialist, painting him as a hardcore communist, and then also painting his successor, um, Carlos Castillo Armas, as good when he was anything but. We know what's happened in Guatemala. So, and Edward Bernays was the nephew of Freud. He wrote a book on propaganda, how to engineer propaganda, and he wrote a book called Engineering of Consent. So maybe this is one of the main arguments of my talk that um, actually intelligence agencies are often very involved in the engineering of consent. Um, some of the books that have been written about this, I mean, the Vietnam War, obviously then, um, William Colby, the head of the CIA, then Operation Phoenix, which was, you know, organizing assassinations. Mark Curtis, Britain's real role, role in worldwide through the intelligence agencies and so on. Um, so he's written several amazing books that really should be better known. Um, and a very recent book by uh, Rory Cormack, Disrupt and Deny, Spy Special Forces and the Secret Pursuit of British Foreign Policy. So it goes into a lot of these details, including, say, Diego Garcia, which became a very important site for collecting intelligence and the indigenous people were thrown out in a really horrendous way. Nigeria, the Biafran War involvement, British involvement, Covert's British involvement in the Vietnam War, Chile, Argentina, Indonesia, British Guyana, Congo, Lumumba, and uh, Lumumba assassination, and so on. So a very dark history that um, a lot of you will know quite well. So um, in my book, I really um, go into the, the British structure of power in India, in colonial India, in the 1830s to 60s. You've got the overt formal social structure, and you've got the non-formal structures. So I think one of the ways of analyzing this is to understand the organizational structure, but also 
the political links, the, the real social structure, as it were. Um, so one of the interesting things is that certain heads of intelligence agencies have become heads of government. In America, the most famous example is Bush the Elder, who was head of the CIA from 75, 76 to 77. And then, of course, Putin, who was a very senior KGB agent from 1975 to 91. And in Israel, many heads of intelligence agencies became heads of government. Actually, in Afghanistan, um, as a friend reminded me earlier today, Ash Ashraf Ghani, the present head, was a professor of anthropology, as well as probably um, very closely working with the CIA. So organizational structure. In Britain, the MI6 is the secret intelligence um, services. Um, it became, it was, its existence was denied until relatively recently. This is the official history, but only up to 1949. Um, MI5 similarly has its own um, uh, official histories and, and many unofficial histories. This is a very interesting book by the same Rory Cormack and Richard Aldrich. So it's about all the British prime ministers of the 20th century and their links with intelligence agencies. So each one from Edward Heath, Wilson, right through to now, to, James, to David Cameron, um, what has been their relationship with the intelligence agencies? Really interesting. Um, this is one of the heads of MI6, um, Maurice Oldfield, very, um, you know, th this, is, this is really, there's, there's so much data in all of these books, obviously. And this is a particularly interesting one because GCHQ was, its existence was kept almost invisible until recently. And only in the 1970s, it came out over Cyprus where there was something called the ABC trials, where Cyprus was a key listening station for the intelligence agencies because Bletchley Park, which we know about in the Second World War, they, the heroic word they did, the ultra um, decipherment and the deciphering the Enigma code. Of course, then now that goes into um, analyzing from SIGINT uh, uh, into um, mass surveillance of all of our emails, basically. Um, and the, the link between GTHQ and NSA is also very, very, has been very, very close since then. Um, I'll come back to GCHQ. One of the other aspects that is to do with the ordinary British police having special units that have infiltrated a lot of environmental and peace groups, often with undercover agents who would form sexual relationships with activists and even sometimes have their babies. I'm sure a lot of you again know about this, but it's important to bring it in here as a vital part of the jigsaw. Um, and this is more a book about the, who is a spy, who becomes spies, the psychology of a spy, that like anthropologists, the psychology of spies is quite interesting to put it mildly. Now, um, we come to whistleblowers and Philip Eggy is one of the most uh, best known CIA whistleblowers. He was very shocked at what he saw throughout Latin America. Um, so he, when he, he finally went on the run after trying to disclose all the names of CIA agents in all the embassies in Europe and so on. Um, this is, I think, his last book, and which is very interesting and exciting. It tells the story more personally about what he experienced in Athens and other places. Um, and then coming to the CIA generally, this is the Bush years. So obviously, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very complex um, history there of regime changes, assassinations, targeted assassinations, and so on. Going, coming to America also, this is maybe the definitive book on the NSA, the National Security Agency. Um, really, uh, again, kept very, very secret until recently. While the CIA is more out there, the NSA has been even bigger, but much more secretive. 
and then the FBI, this is just one particular story of where they were in bed with the Mafia, basically. Um, but that's within America. Now, coming to um, surveillance, uh, this is a, an excellent book. The first chapter is about whistleblowers, where it looks at Dan Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers of the 1960s, up to uh, Bradley Manning, Chelsea Manning. Um, and of course, the vast difference then, Dan Ellsberg spent a whole year photocopying things while Chelsea Manning could just send it in a, in a few emails. Um, but, you know, both of them very courageous. And actually, Dan Ellsberg got off fairly lightly while Chelsea Manning has been really gone through a very hard time. Um, a couple of books I haven't got here. One of them that really shows the links between the American and probably the British intelligence agencies with the arms companies is a book by Adrian Levi and Kathy Scott Clark called Deception, Pakistan, US, and the Global Nuclear Weapons Conspiracy, which shows how the CIA funded Pakistan's ISI for years, even knowing that half the money was going to Pakistan developing nuclear weapons. And even when Pakistan was buying some warplanes from America and actually fitting them to carry nuclear missiles, potentially, and CIA people who were seeing that were silenced because it, America wanted to go ahead with the arms deal. So um, another very interesting book about how the CIA infiltrated student unions, like they have infiltrated left movements a lot. This is Karen Paget, Patriotic, Patriotic Betrayal, Inside Story of CIA's Secret Campaign to Enroll American Students Against Communism. Uh, 2015 book. Um, and then obviously one comes to Cambridge Analytica and where the use of data that's collected illegally for political purposes. And then that links to all of the intelligence agencies at any one time are full of infighting, are full of sometimes you've got the CIA not working with the FBI or the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, or at cross purposes and different heads with different political or ideological agendas. So, you know, of course, this is a, a very um, complex thing. Uh, one of the things maybe to mention too is um, the Dan Ellsberg in Vietnam and then Bradley Manning, what motivated them to become whistleblowers was partly the torture of innocent victims, um, and of course the Apache helicopter killings that were the prime thing that Bradley Manning um, brought out. So then we come to the whole subjects that I highlighted with the role of Edward Bonice and PR, the real terror network, terrorism in fact and propaganda. So Edward Herman really brought out how, as Chomsky often says that the main terrorist government has mostly been the United States. So manufacturing consent, the political economy of the mass media. He goes mainly into Vietnam, Indonesia, Latin America in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and it's, it's a classic and it should be because manufacturing consent, Edward Bernays, engineering of consent, this is maybe, I, as I see it, the core of how intelligence agencies work. And coming to modern times, this book has been absolutely key for me because um, it shows how the media now is infiltrated. And in particular, if you look at this book, chapter two is called Killing Corbyn. It's about how the media was orchestrated against Corbyn. Chapter four, Israel and Palestine, where BBC neutrality isn't really so neutral. Chapter five on Libya. Chapter six on Syria, which I'll come back to. Chapter seven on Yemen. And chapter eight is called BBC as Propaganda Machine. And it's a very strong case, talking about how the BBC is 
has been controlled, really. But in particular, the other media outlet they talk about most is The Guardian. And one of the um, key articles for me here was sent recently by a friend in RAG. And it's an article by Matt Kennard and Mark Curtis, the same Mark Curtis. And the article you can Google, it's called How the UK Security Services Neutralized the Country's Leading Liberal Newspaper. And it's in a, a website called Declassified, dated 11 September last year. So basically, he shows how when Snowden and Assange chose the Guardian as the um, one place to, to send the WikiLeaks material to, GCHQ got very worried indeed. And they send out things called D-notices. So um, I'm hearing somebody else there, but it's, it's okay. I'm maybe about halfway through here. Um, or, yeah, I'll try and keep it a bit shorter. Um, but I think this is a very, a very key, a key thing to understand what happened in June to July 2013. That in July 2013, GCHQ sent a team to the Guardian offices and made them destroy the hard drives and the computers with the WikiLeaks material on. Um, so, and David Cameron um, gave, a, gave a speech saying, I don't want to serve D-notices, meaning it was a kind of veiled threat that compliance with D-notices is meant to be voluntary, but the Guardian was lent on very hard because it wasn't going along with the D-notices, which means um, the way it's phrased is to prevent inadvertent public disclosure of information that would compromise UK military and intelligence operations. So in 2015, when Catherine Viner took over as editor of The Guardian, coming from Australia, so we've got the five eyes, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, USA, and Britain. Um, after that, the head of MI5 and MI6 went on board to The Guardian and they gave disclosures and the first ever interviews with that serving head of MI5 and MI6 but in The Guardian to, as it were, help bring them on board. Um, this was in 2016 and 17, and you find the links in this article I just gave you. Um, also a link to how um, in, uh, in 2018, the High Court in London was set to review the decision not to prosecute the head of MI6, who in 2004, Sir Mark Allen, had sent Abdel Hakim Belhaj back to Libya. He was an opponent of Gaddafi, where of course he was tortured. So this is the kind of um, operations that, you know, brave journalists have been bringing these things out and, you know, terrible decisions have been made at the head of government, especially in foreign policy. So coming now to Snowden himself, I don't know how many of you, if any of you have read his new book, which is very, very readable and very um, moving to read. Uh, before that came out, Luke Harding did a bit of a character assassination job on, um, on Snowden. Of course, hitting the airwaves now is this book, which is great, but it doesn't go enough into the intelligence agencies in a way. And just to mention here on um, 5G itself, which I'll come to at the very end. It is a tool for intelligence agencies, whatever else it is. And the very first mention I heard of it on Radio 4 was the Huawei dispute. Um, but they brought first the head of British intelligence on to the Radio 4 news program to explain why 5G is going to make all of our lives much, much better. So very significant to me bringing on the head of intelligence then. Okay, I'm zapping through, coming to Israel. So this is a book like almost you could say Mossad's Greatest Hits. Um, it's it's an, a very, very um, 
moving and exciting history because Israel has been often under attack. Um, the war with Hezbollah and others has been very, very brutal. And in a way, Israel's intelligence agents are national heroes. Um, this is a much more detailed and more objective book by Warren Bergman, Rise and Kill First. So really detailed history of, and this is very important because the Israel intelligence agencies have been very influential on all countries, as well as, of course, armed surveillance, counter insurgency techniques, and so on, like in India and other countries, I'm sure you know. Ronan Bergman also wrote an amazing book called The Secret War with Iran, which is again quite carefully balanced. I'm sure there's all kinds of faults in it, but basically he goes through the evidence very, very strongly, especially between Israel, Hezbollah, Iran funding Hezbollah, and so on. Um, okay, we're getting fairly near the end now. I'm, I'm going to come now to the whole idea of um, whistleblowers again. Uh, this is another key one. He was instrumental in the CIA in capturing a key terrorist in um, Afghanistan. Uh, or was, uh, No, it was in Pakistan he captured Abu... Um, sorry, I'm... Uh, anyway, uh, you, you can uh, <laughs> read all about it here. Um, he, was, he wrote this book partly because he was told that this terrorist he had captured, who was very close to Osama bin Laden, was only waterboarded once. But then he discovered he was waterboarded more than 80 times. And he really came out, he left the CIA and became a whistleblower on this issue of torture. Um, so then uh, Guantanamo and the, what really has been happening in Guantanamo, which until I read this book, I didn't know, um, very uh, like a black site within Guantanamo in, in where people had been killed. Um, then of course, the whole thing of conspiracies and conspiracy theories. So it starts with Kennedy assassination. And these are a couple of, to me, very good books about the going through the evidence on who killed Kennedy. And I suppose basically the upshot of those books is probably the CIA or certain people within it did have something to do with it. Um, and then the, the Warren report was a kind of whitewash. Then one can't not mention 9-11. And I don't know whether any of you have written. I don't know anybody who's gone through David Ray Griffin's evidence who can still believe the 9-11 commission report is true. He, it, this, but I, I won't go more into it then. Um, some of the surrounding aspects very, very well dealt with in this book, um, which spends less on 9-11 itself and more on before and afterwards. And also, to do with the invasion of Iraq, Susan and Lindau was a peace activist who worked with the CIA to try to stop the invasion of Iraq. And when Iraq was invaded, she was put in, in a military prison and given psychological torture, basically. And so she, she got out and she wrote this book. Another key um, American intelligence agent who who wrote about what happened in, in those years um, is Michael Ruppert's very moving book. It starts with his girlfriend was in drugs enforcement and he found her basically orchestrating from Miami the CIA taking over of the drugs trade because under the cover of the war on drugs, Reagan actually, under, under Reagan's presidency, the CIA started massive um, importing of, of cocaine and other drugs into America. But that's only one small part of what he shows in this amazing book. Um, another key whistleblower from those years after 9-11, Sybil Edmonds. This is a, a novel that she wrote. She wrote her life as a novel. 
but before that she wrote a book called Classified Woman because she worked in the FBI. What she was seeing didn't add up and um, she was really hounded uh, for bringing that out, but she survived to tell the tale. So those are just some of the, um, well, many, many books. Jeremy Scahill is a fantastic writer about the secret operations, the black operations. Um, his book on black water, so covert operations. Um, Michael Hastings going into detail in Afghanistan and his own um, sweetheart was killed when he was working as a journalist in Baghdad. So he starts in what happened in Iraq. And Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize, but we all know, you know, he started drone attacks became normalized against other countries. So it should be remembered. Now, before I finish, I want to look a little bit at these other countries, in particular Syria. So I don't know how many of you know Tim Anderson's book, which goes through the evidence on what's really happened in Syria, which is very different from the story we get in the mainstream media. Um, along with him, Vanessa Beely and Eve Bartlett, you can find their videos very um, easily. So in a way, the official story of the CIA and the British government started in 2011, 12, 13, by funding what was called the Free Syrian Army. But very soon, we, we came to know that most of them defected to al-Nusra, ISIS and other organizations. So after, after that, um, if you look up, because we know that the CIA and maybe Mossad have quite a lot of influence over Wikipedia. If you look up the CIA and S Syria, you find Operation Timber Sycamore. So it's quite, you can read about how the CIA funded opposition to Assad through Jordan and so on. But I think the real story is more, it's more important to understand the whole issue of the White Helmets, which is why John Pilger's um, forward to the Propaganda Blitz book really goes into detail about basically the White Helmets when you understand and go through all the data about them, they, um, they, the headquarters in the parts of Syria opposed to Assad are always next to the administration, which would be ISIS or al-Nusra. And they, they specialize in propaganda in a very, very dark way indeed. And over 400 white helmet families have been resettled recently in the UK. So this is important to understand. And again, through The Guardian. So somebody called Olivia Solon, wrote an article in 18 December 2017 called How Syria's White Helmets Became Victims of an Online Propaganda Machine. Many, so this attacks the attacks on the White Helmets and many people have responded to that, but Guardian would never print. The, the criticisms to me seem unassailable. But again, if you look up White Helmets in Wikipedia, all you see is that there's been a propaganda campaign against them. Okay, that's pretty much all on Syria. Just to go into Turkey very briefly, some of you will know that I've worked a lot with Kurdish people over the years, and what's happening in Turkey is also crucial to the Middle East, and especially to the rebels in um, fighting in Syria in particular have been funded and armed through Turkey. So, for example, a Reuters report, 21 May 2015, exclusive. Turkish intelligence helped ship arms to Syrian Islamist rebel areas. I mean, this has been, people in Turkey know it backwards, like how infiltrated um, Turkish, how implicated Turkish intelligence has been in the war in Syria. Also, Israel has been implicated. Obviously, ISIS don't usually, if ever, attack Israel. In fact, there's a lot of footage of ISIS wounded fighters being treated in hospital in Israel and so on. I especially work with the uh, Kurds. And if you go to the freeodulan.org website, in February, I was in on an Imrali delegation. Ojalan was captured in 1999 through the combined services of 
at least a dozen countries' intelligence agencies, where Greece betrayed him, Russia betrayed him. He was finally captured from the Greek embassy in Kenya and taken back to Turkey by the Israelis, where he was condemned to death, but then has written some amazing books from his island prison on Imrali. <clears throat> so painting the PKK as a terrorist organization is a big subject and very important to understand about. And people like Chomsky, John Pilger, uh, really help anybody who, who is open to see, to understand that. This is another of the la latest books about the Ojalan situation, which is, and the, and the Kurdish situation in, in Turkey in particular, but also in Rojava and so on. So finally, before I end, my own country is India and probably the Indian intelligence agents are the one that know me best, so I'm not gonna talk much about them, but just to give one of the best books about the Maoist civil war in central India that has enrolled thousands of Adivasis as SPO, special police officers, to fight the Maoists who are also maybe hundreds or thousands of Adivasis have been um, enrolled as Maoists. And to me, it is in a way coming back to the Khmer situation in Laos and Vietnam of how, in a sense, the intelligence agency controls Maoists, remote controls them. If the, if the Maoists didn't exist, they would have to create them. And especially in Jharkhand, you see many false Maoist fronts that are controlled very, almost openly by the intelligence agency and the police. So that's just to give one India story. And the other India story I, I can't not mention, a very key Kashmiri uh, intelligence officer was arrested on the 11th of January this year called Davinder Singh. So he was captured in a jeep in Kashmir with two terrorists, but he was also involved in the Purwama attack that was a very dangerous um, attack that nearly brought war between India and Pakistan in February last year. And also he was the police officer who ordered Afsal Guru to take a man called Mohammed to Delhi in December 2001. And this Mohammed was then the leader of the five terrorists who drove into the Indian parliament soon after 9-11 in December 2001 and died with their guns blazing. And so Afshal Guru was finally hanged for that when it, it is very obvious to anybody who's read the details, for example, Aaron Datiwari writes about his story, um, that he was ordered to do this um, on, on pain of torture. So, and there's some amazing articles about this uh, intelligence officer, uh, Devinder Singh. Um, published in the Indian me media, like about his role in the Pulwama attack and so on. Now, coming to right now, because I, I want um, as much feedback as possible. Um, on the subject of 5G, I, I want to review this book. And if anybody knows, Radical Anthropology doesn't exist anymore, it's a journal. So if anybody knows website, I can review it. I would love to, because it's huge. It, its title, Augmented Reality, is maybe a very good term for what we're living in now, that we're communicating very beautifully by Zoom, but we're all living partly in virtual reality. So what is 5G is taken almost as a philosophical, as well as a, the practicalities and the um, technicalities of it. So. I'd love help with that. And of course, the subject of 5G, of vaccination, of the pandemic itself, I don't think on the BBC one can have a very frank discussion. On, on the pandemic, I would just point to the GPNB, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, set up in 2018 by the World Bank with the WHO. Um, the role they seem to have behind the scenes uh, and the influence they have over governments. Because obviously one aspect of the pandemic is that people, all the demonstrations that were sweeping the world can't happen anymore. So conspiracy theories, conspiracies, which is which it, it's become very hard to tell. 
Um, but maybe the title of one of those books, um, The War on Truth. Uh, some people use the term post-truth, which um, kind of debases the whole discussion. But um, I'd like to leave it there and, and open up for questions now, please. And, and comments and whatever other people would like to say. Uh, thank you very much, Felix. Um, there are lots of people putting their hands up. I know that, that people have been asking especially, can you produce a reading list of this amazingly comprehensive um, review of the literature? I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, I'll Fantastic. do that. Yeah. We'll post that onto our Facebook page. Um, so, okay, Galaxy Tab, you've had your hand up for a long time. Who are you? Do you want to ask a question? Anybody else who wants to ask a question? Or comment? Richard, Richard Repnack? Um, Joshua, you, you also have your hand up. Can anybody who's got the hand up um, ask questions, please? You have to unmute your microphone. Yeah. They are unmuted. They are unmuted, but we can't hear. It's really strange. Josh, I can't hear you. Josh, I can't hear you, even though you're unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more when you started talking about India, um, you, were, you were talking about the creation if, if you, I think you said something um, about if the Maoists didn't exist, they would have to be created. And that just uh, interested me a lot, um, just because that sounds like something straight out of the standard intelligence agency playbook, you know, with the continuity between the Phoenix program all the way to uh, the, the, you know, our modern day uh targeted assassination program and the uh you know link analysis and everything that's going on with the global war on terror which seems essentially like uh, absolutely yeah terrorist, you know this relates to one of the key patterns i want to draw attention to that in india as in turkey everybody can see hundreds of what we could call false flag attacks where maoist or kashmiris are killed in cold blood and it's what, what is called in India openly a false encounter. Like in Manipur alone, there have been over 1,500 false encounters recognized by the Supreme Court. So one of the aspects is just like, if you like, the CIA set up people like bin Laden to be first to, first to get rid of the Soviet Union and undermine it in, in Afghanistan and so on, but then in a way also to to create its own enemy. And going back to Iran, say, I think it was the Muslim Brotherhood and in Egypt and Iran that, and other extreme Islamic groups that the British supported to get rid of Mossadegh. So in the same way in, I saw it in, with the Maoists very clearly when a couple of Italian, a tourist and a tour operator who did tribal tours were captured by the Maoists. And the Maoists released a statement, we demand an end to these tribal tours of tourists coming to see tribal people like monkeys and very proper words. But then the, immediately the Indian government and the Orissa government, they, they didn't only ban tribal tours, they banned any foreigners from entering those areas. So um, then no foreigners could go there and witness what's happening. So instead of the Dongre Kons, who are the people I, I've been with, instead of having tourists coming to photograph them, they had the CRPF, the Central Reserve Police Force, coming and committing atrocities. So that's a kind of example where you, you see a statement that the Indian police is wanting to make, like no tourists should go there, but coming out of the mouths of Maoists. That's just one very small example. And I could talk for, uh, for a long time about this, but thank you. Um, can, can anybody else says, Richard, can you be, can you unmute now? Uh, well, Mark, 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 Mark Jamison wants to speak. Mark. 
Richard well, had a question. Hello, Felix. Um, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Um, that was uh, really Hi. fascinating. Yeah, I was wondering um, if you, this is just, um, if you know of any good uh, uh, literature for um, the role of uh, uh, narco trafficking on, um, in Nicaragua. And we know um, this is in the present rather than in the 1980s, what's going on right now. And particularly, I'm particularly interested in the uh, Caribbean coast of Nicaragua and Central America more generally. No, wonderful subject. I've read one or two books about the CIA involvement in narco tracking from um, America, South America generally, and Latin America, but I, I don't know. Nicaragua, I, all of us have to do research, and I hope maybe this will form a beginning to, to give input, because we all work in our different areas and don't follow much, like I follow Nicaragua very little. So I think it's, it's a very important question. Well, Mark is quite an expert in Nicaragua, um... Felix, so perhaps you should, you should get together, the two of you. Definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and, and yeah. And, and Mark, your, your latest product, Mark, isn't it? It's on, it's on the, the cocaine uh, trade in, in relationship to the mosquito people that you've been working with um, and, the, and the damage that's done, but maybe not, you haven't specifically um, focused on the sort of CIA involvement, I don't think, so far. Um. I think mosquito people is a very relevant issue because like the Hmong, they were maybe used in the war against the left in Nicaragua and have therefore been compromised. And I don't know a fraction of the story as, as you people do. Um, is it Paige? Paige, you, you've got your hand up. Hi, thank you for such an interesting um, discussion. I have a lot of new material for my quarantine reading now. Um, but um, I've been listening to a podcast called The Winds of Change that talks about, um, investigates whether the CIA was involved in um, behind the, the song The Winds of Change by the Scorpions that was an anthem during the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I was, you mentioned, um, you mentioned um, the, the news media quite a bit, but um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about um, the role of intelligence agencies meddling in popular culture and the manufacture of uh, popular culture. I feel like it very much is under the manufacturing consent umbrella, but. Uh. I, I feel, I mean, that is such an interesting um, subject because if you go to say James Bond is where it starts for the British, especially, the image of MI6 is given out by um, Ian Fleming in James Bond. And in a, in a more uh, balanced way by Le Carre in, in his amazing novels, but then, Coming to more recent culture, I think it's just gone haywire. I think there must be so much infiltration in, in that. But where it's gone, I, I, I haven't begun to analyze. I think it's very important to analyze though. Um, Toyin, Agbetu, Ag have you got a question? Your hands up. Yes, I do. Um, thank you, hold on, let me see if I can uh, set this all going. And um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we yeah, can't fine. see you. Can you, un can you start your video so we can see I you? I just tried. There you are, there you are. Yeah, there you are. There oh, are. okay, hi. Uh, thanks, Felix. That was a really fascinating talk and I really appreciated all the, the knowledge you dropped there. I'm actually looking forward to reading this propaganda blitz. I, I, you know, I'm very interested in that topic. But what I'd like to know from you is do you have any idea of literature or tips for successful activist-based counterintelligence strategies? Because that's, it's very well known kind of like how intelligence agencies work mm. in the wrong way. Um, but do you have any ideas on how we can work back? Uh, you know, there was this book on, uh, by Noam Chomsky about uh, indie media many years back, which is a really good blueprint. But of course, that's no longer so relevant because of the way that the social media giants have actually monopolized uh, that, that, that type of communication. No, I mean, thank you. That is, that is the most important question, really. And I, I must admit, I'm, I'm new to taking on this topic. So, um, you know, as an activist against mining companies, it's one thing. Against education mafia in India is another, which um, I hope my friend Malvika Gupta will talk about soon. But um, in how one does activism against intelligence agencies, it's a very complex thing because they are already 
many steps ahead of us in terms of um, the technology and the infiltration. But, you know, maybe we do have often the moral high ground. So how to use that in a almost non -viol I think maybe the more effective, the more nonviolent one is the more effective, but really outing people, really calling people to task, like maybe the present um, campaign against Dominic Cummings, it doesn't seem to be successful so far, but how can an unelected person have, wield such power? Scary. Um, it, it's quite a good example. Okay. Uh, you Galaxy Tab, have you, you've got your hand up, whoever Galaxy Tab's real name is. Um, and, and also Levin, I don't know. Galaxy, are you there or shall I move to Levin? Um, uh, hello, yeah. uh, hello, Felix. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, so my question is, how do you uh, politically cate categorize uh, the activities of intelligence agencies? Because uh, in India, like now, BJP is in power, but earlier Congress and other parties were uh, were in power actually. But if you see the way intelligence uh, agencies are operating, it's more or less the same. So how do you like categorize? Uh, uh, now people are saying that BJP is a, a quasi uh, quasi uh, fascist party, uh, but Congress is uh, not like that. But if you see the history of intelligence agency, it is like you know operating uh, more or less the same way. So how exactly. do you like you know how do you like you know is it fascism or is it authoritarianism or it's like uh, it's it's a part of you know liberal democracy. So how do you like politically uh, theorize the activities of intelligence uh, agencies? in the context of the subcontinent, in the context of India. So, okay, so if you yeah. go back to the Nazi past that I've tried to um, show how, in a way, the Nazi organization was actually used by the CIA. So obviously the Nazis were, if you like, fascist, or technically fascist was Mussolini, but the, the Nazis were national socialists. <laughs> but I mean, um, the way maybe intelligence agencies have a tendency to work as a kind of fascist structure. But within every intelligence agency of every country at every, any time, you see huge infighting. And maybe some intelligence agents' heads are Congress linked, some are BJP linked, that some make the transition and um, flip flop as it's called. Um, but then you, sometimes it comes out in the Indian press, like huge fights between different intelligence agents' heads. So I think that's part of the answer to your question. We, we, there's no point saying this person is more fascist than that. Obviously, the Congress, just like the British government, has enormous fascist tendencies within it. Um, and then other people who are more democratically minded, even within the IB in India, there are obviously some very good people who've really tried to fight for bringing out truth of any particular case. So, I, I, I mean, that's, you know, I, I don't, I can't answer in terms of the categorizes who is fascist, who is not, is, you know, always debatable. But um, obviously the, the present government, the, the role of the RSS, which is an unelected organization, is massive within both the intelligence agencies and within the BJP party and in, within local governments too. So very complex, but it, it, it's not a simple answer because intelligence agencies is always a jigsaw. Um, can I? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so the thing is, the the kind of secrecy that uh, those uh, uh, intelligence agencies maintain. So is it democracy? I mean, is it a, a threat for democracy, liberal democracy? Like I think it very much is. When the intelligence agents have more power, and that's the fight of Snowden. That Snowden was, he became a whistleblower because he saw how the NSA and GCHQ in Britain were. Collecting all the data about all of us, and he thought that is not democratic. And of course, that has become normalised in India. I've heard senior policemen say, "Well, look, they're there. We've been watching all the time. I mean, they can see our Facebook, they can see our emails, they can see everything, um, or, or or can they? You know, but they always that's always the danger. And then the misuse of power in that it's it's enormous, and that's what." Um, you know, a lot of groups are fighting rearguard actions to try to stop MI5 or the IB or 
the NSA collecting our data. So it is a fascist <clears throat> tendency to try to control like that. Can I can I um, ask you a question? Um, w when we were planning this event, this Zoom event, some of my f old uh, comrades and friends from uh, Reclaim the Streets were saying, Chris, what on earth are you doing? <laughs> You're going to be using Zoom for a, for a session on um, exactly. GCHQ, and it just means that your whole session will be beamed up and projected on the walls, the inside walls of GCHQ, and they'll be having a great laugh watching us all because that's, you know, because Zoom itself is, is completely run <laughs> I'm sure. told, um, by the intelligence agents. That's just but that's, one thing. Um, to me, that's I, why. To me, to me when those sort of things, you just have to say, well, let's give them information overload. I mean, let's just give them more information than they really need. And make them think. I well, mean, if they're, if they're working in intelligence, they need to yeah. use that intelligence to have intelligence about themselves. What is their, each yeah. one of them, what yeah. is their role? What are they doing? Yeah. What are the power structures that are, con well, that, that are tying their hands? Yeah. 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 What, what, what's happening to their conscience? You know, these are, like anthropologists, we've been through that again and again. Each generation of anthropologists mm. Is, is questioning more, trying to decolonize more. But I, I wanted to go a little bit beyond that. I, and I mean, of course, I, I totally agree with you. And there's no point. I mean, I was told, why don't you use something more encrypted, like Jitsi meat or something? And of course, there's, there's no, just trying to sort of hide and hide and hide and hide further back and back and back. It's just, it's, it, we need to do the exact opposite, it seems to me. And, and that's what we're doing now, of course. But, I agree. But, but, but OK, but now, because everything you've said is so convincing, there is, there is the danger, and I'm not saying you're falling into it or I'm falling into it, but the, the danger is that you begin to see conspiracies everywhere. And of course, now in the lockdown, I'm, I'm bombarded with people who tell me that they've got strong evidence and yeah. it goes all sorts of different ways, that the, that the whole um, coronavirus was um, invented. I mean, I, obviously the, the common one is that it was invented in, in Wuhan in their, in their lab and it was done in order to, you know, to... Um, sort of <laughs> kill the, the United States economy. But of course, on the other side, there's all kinds of stories I keep, I keep hearing saying, well, look, you know, you just say who gains, who benefits. And then you say, well, Amazon benefits, um, Zoom benefits, all the digital companies are benefiting. And maybe they invented the, the coronavirus and stuff. And it just seems to me that, that's, that, that all of that is pretty, pretty absurd. I mean, because all kinds of scientists have been warning us for a very long time, a pandemic is going to arise. And the thing is that I can't, I can't imagine, you know, I, I can't see any reason why, um, you know, capitalists would want to completely destroy their own economy. There's all kinds of things that you can, you can sort of say, obviously certain capitalists do benefit and others don't. But there comes a point where you have to be, you know, you have to be fairly sober and level-headed against the-, the I, I agree. And I mean, that's why this, yeah, this yeah. what's happening with pandemic, mm. I mean, I don't even want to get into it now, but it's, um, I'm, I'm giving the history of both conspiracies that the CIA and independent agents have worked through conspiracies, mm. but also conspiracy theories are sometimes, you know, the flat earth conspiracy is often, I think, put up there as a straw man to, to dismiss 5G uh, yeah. worries and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. Okay, who else has got their hand up? Uh, Deb Boy, your uh, tea Simon, dust. Your hand Simon Hunt. Oh, Simon. Simon okay. Wells. Okay, go on, Simon. I can see Debo Yorti Das has got the hand up. Hello, Hello. Felix. Hello, Felix. Can Hi, you Deb. Yeah, yeah, great, you're there. Yeah. So, so with, with my question is in relation to the COVID-19 crisis, like if you have looked at South Korea, how they have managed this whole crisis by kind of, you know, intervening into the personal data of individuals. So that became a big controversy and which we cannot do in Western liberal democracies, particularly in the United States and the UK. So my question is that given this liberty that states will kind of implement in this COVID-19 environment, uh, uh, how do you see the, you know, the whole intelligence agency, the whole kind of establishment kind of then intruding into your personal data, your bank balances, your kind of communication with people. So, so do you not see that the whole COVID situation has made our life more precarious and exposed to, um, you know, kind of monitoring from the state? Exactly. And I don't think it's a coincidence that 5G is being rolled out during the pandemic. So, you know, 5G is an intelligence tool, just like Facebook is, but much more so. Um, so, you know, are we just going to surrender all of our rights to, to be monitored um, in, in the name of a medical emergency? They, 
that only could have been locked down in the name of medical emergency. They couldn't stop um, all the demonstrations that were sweeping India and so many other countries in any other way except for a medical emergency. That's not to say this is a conspiracy, but I think we all ought to keep an open mind that you know, the Bill Gates, the GPMB and so on, um, there is a lot going on behind the scenes. There are conspiracy theories that are crazy and there are also probably real conspiracies in there. Mm. Simon, Simon, Simon Wells. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah my video is lots. You've disabled my video. Um, and anyway, I'll ask the question. Um, it's just going back to your question, Chris, around um, uh, COVID and just moving on from uh, Snowden, because I, I should think things have moved on from Snowden and this sort of the spying, inf the information that the, our spies have got, have got has probably ramped up during this uh, period, especially when we've now got sort of this track and tracing apps are now being rolled out across the Five Eyes countries. Um, and they're, um, I don't know whether you've heard of the 77th Brigade, who, who sort of um, are part of sort of the uh, a wing of the army who've, who've potentially got spies in terms of uh, trying to close down any narrative in regard of having a sensible conversation about COVID and any other explanations about why there might be this virus might have arisen or the potential lethality of it. Um, so Silicon Valley, the interaction between, between them and spies and um, track and trace, you know, this app, you know, where, where does this information go to? Because I, and I understand it, this information, we give our details on this app, it's going to be filtered by sort of a wing of the government. We don't know who, I think it's part of the armed services as far as I understand it. And then it's going to go to the NHS. Where is that filtered information going to go? Where it, where it sort of filters out our names and I'll sort of put information, and that information is going to be sort of stored. It's going to be stored somewhere. So where's that information going? So it's just the current situation around information gathering, narratives around, and sort of policing the net, policing what we can actually say and how we communicate and social distancing and all that sort of thing. Absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the references I didn't give, but I'll give it um, is... The whole history of MI5, MI6 and GCHQ collecting data, just like Snowden warned of, in Britain, and the High Court ruling it's illegal, but with no power to stop it. So, in effect, this collecting of data has become normalised, even though it's still supposed to be illegal. Um, so, you know, that's the context that's been building up in the last two years in the British courts. So... Exactly. I mean, I, I hope this, um, I, I will share a full bibliography tomorrow if I can. And I hope you'll also all give inputs to it too. And, and with questions and comments too. How, how are we going to receive and, and share your bibliography? What's the mechanism we're going to be using? Because Well, I will send you a document tomorrow. Yeah. And then you can <laughs> share it on the website or what? I'm well, not sure how to do it? I mean, can yeah, I have... no, Chris, Chris, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear? Yes, I can. Yes, I can yeah. Um, we can place the document on Facebook if that's appropriate. Okay. All right. Put we'll put the fact on the um, Radical Anthropology Group Facebook page. We can yeah. link the document up on Facebook. Okay. Okay. That's Does everyone fine. hear that? That's where it's going to go. So it's it's Radical Anthropology's Facebook page. Good. Okay. That's good. Um, somebody else, there's Sam A has a question. Sam. Can you mute? Hi, yeah, sorry. It's I it's actually in a feast of it. My Zoom is being funny, so I'm 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 leaving it as Sam. Um I yeah, I guess I have kind of a question. I I guess I'm more skeptical probably than and than more uh, than not. Like, you know, I'm obviously understand the evidence of the whistleblowers and I'm very attuned to the idea that intelligence agencies are listening but then obviously when we get into the kind of more conspiracy theory uh, branch of it I think I'm more skeptical of that and what keeps coming up in these conversations and the back and forth we've just had is this relationship to rights and rule of law and the, the arm of the judiciary if it's illegal well you know what can they do and 
I'm just more, I'm quite interested in what you have to say about rights, um, because you haven't, you know, specifically talked about them a lot, uh, and an and idea of how rights would work, or kind of legal protection would work in a system in which, under which we acknowledge, you know, that intelligence agencies are listening, like, what, have our rights changed as a result? Who decides on those rights? You know, that very kind of Arendtian sort of question on the same issue. I just think it's really relevant in, in discussing what privacy is, and I would like, you know, to get your ideas on that, okay? I, I mean, just to say it, it is hugely relevant, and I think this is, if you read, um, uh, Snowden's book, I think it remains very, very relevant because the, he was understanding precisely back there in 2012, 13 or before what was about to happen, that all our data was being hoovered up and normal rights were being undermined. So we're in that situation more than ever now. Um, and, you know, there, there are many groups that are trying to do something about it. So your question stands. You Anybody did a, else? You did a fantastic survey, Felix. It's um, really, really quite astonishing. Um, and it's lovely to see all those books. Um, you, uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, uh, I, 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 I suppose what, I, you, you say you're not used to doing this. It's something a little bit new. How much of a connection have you been made with the, the, just the, the survey of all the different things that the intelligence agencies have been doing and yourself as an anthropologist? I mean, perhaps I could just say, we build this as the anthropology of in, the intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, you haven't really been an anthropologist. You haven't, you haven't, I mean, I, I'm not sure how, how you would be an anthropologist uh, studying these people. I suppose you'd have to take them in a particular local community. How do they become spies? How were they turned? Were they turned? I mean, all those things. I, I imagine that as an anthropologist, you would have, you'd have to have a less of a global scope. I mean, the, the brilliant thing about what you've done um, this evening is just the sheer scope of it all. Uh, and it really is breathtaking and very, very impressive scholarship. But you could argue that in this role, you're not exactly being an anthropologist. No, thank you so much, Chris. I, I, <laughs> I, I was waiting for somebody to ask this question because there's nothing anthropological in what I've, in the, in the books I've shown. It's sort of history, it's journalism, it's other things, but so the question is, where are the anthropologists studying this? I, I, I did mention a book early on studying in colonial India, how the British used anthropology to collect data and um, intelligence, as it were, about the populations in India. But my first book, it studied up. So I'm studying the British power structure in India, which means the governor general in Calcutta, the other um, top people in the Madras government and the Bombay government and the Delhi government and how they're all, how the military works with the civil government, the role of police when they come in, the role of forest guards, which is crucial for our devices, the power structure. So one studying up, one can't, you know, if you go to, um, I remember when I was studying sociology in Delhi School of Economics and one of my classmates said, I want to study the police. Well, he wasn't given permission for that, you know. The Indian police didn't want to be studied. Um, so it's not easy to, to, to study up. Remind us of your first book. Remind us, of the title. No, remind us of the title of your first book. Have you got it with you, your first book? Very or at least tell us time. what it was called. It's called Sacrificing People, Sacrificing. Invasions of a Tribal Landscape. But actually its oh, first yeah. title, when it was first published in 95, was British Rule and the Cons of Orissa. So and it was actually studying the social structure of how anthropologists were part of the power structure. So in terms of what's happening now, that's why I emphasize the formal structure of, okay, this is MI6, this is MI5, this is the CIA, this is the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and how they work with the NSA, and there's these arguments, sometimes they come together. This is Mossad, this is the other... Israeli intelligence agent, and so on. But the informal structure is the infighting between them, the links to the political parties and particular politicians, um, and the actual behavior, the targeted assassinations that um, 
like the crucial things that happened in Israel when they were shown to be killing people in cold blood and that came out and it was very uncomfortable and the Israeli public was very angry about it. So this is the anthropological stuff. One, one looks for the structures, the patterns uh, beyond the, the individual likes and dislikes and personalities. Stroudy, um, would you, I wanted to ask a question, your hands up, you need to unmute yourself. Hello, thank you Felix for your talk, it's very interesting. I was wondering, you talked about news stations, the BBC and the Guardian, I wonder which news station you find to be uh, perhaps maybe the least corrupt or the most reliable one to, to listen to at the moment and if there's one that you would look for are you more listening to pod podcasts and reading books about the news or what's happening at the moment where do you source your information all kinds of places because i work in india and because i i've also worked quite a bit in the kurdish issues in turkey and rojava there are particular websites for that um because i don't work so much on latin america i don't for example know the websites where you go for that on america for example when Glenn Greenwald left the corporate media and started The Intercept and other people then critique him on certain issues. So this is the, do you call it the alternative media? I don't know, but The Intercept is, is fairly, a fairly good source on, on certain international issues and American policy. Um, it's, there's not a simple answer to that. What and of course, be, one listens to the BBC to, to see what they're saying. What would be your verdict on Al Jazeera? Well, they're quite close to the government of... Um, where are they? <laughs> uh, the United Arab Emirates, aren't they? So oh, it's they're Qatar, quite... It's Qatar, is it? Qatar. Qatar, yes, thank you. So, yes, they, they, they give a much freer view of what's happening in India, what's happening in many countries than you do from the mainstream Indian or international mainstream media, but I think they have their own biases on certain Middle Eastern issues, obviously. I would still recommend Al Jazeera, it's a lot better than the BBC and many that others. That is an understatement, yes. <laughs> hey, can I intervene, just ask uh, on Rojava, um, Felix, because yes. It's a very, it's a very tricky situation with the um, uh, inextricable links to the U.S. now and to yes. Trump um, in support of their, the struggle against ISIS, but also it it kind of tars the whole reputation of the Rojava revolution. Um, what what do you think about this? What do you what do you? Okay, think? no, that's a very important question. I'm glad you asked it because if you look at like that's why the very first book I showed was what's happening, what happened in Vietnam with an indigenous people, the Hmong, mm -hmm. because the CIA, the same with Tibetans, the same with Kurds, the CIA very openly supported the Kurds in Iraq and mm -hmm. helped set up the autonomous region of North Iraq, yeah. Kurdish led. Yeah. Similarly, they're, they're doing something in Iran, yeah. probably to destabilize Iran, the, supporting the Kurdish rebel groups there. And similarly, both Israel and the CIA have at times, you could say flirted with and supported the YPG. But um, from the start, the YPG and the Rojava administration have been very critical and almost said, well, if, if they're offered, when they were offered the support of the Syrian Democratic Alliance that they formed part of with the American forces, maybe they couldn't say no. And maybe they didn't really have that much choice. No. And one thing that was certain was they were bound to be betrayed, as they were betrayed so horrendously in last October. Mm. And over, you know, in what's happened, the BBC goes on about East Ghouta and Idlib, but it hardly mentioned the invasion of Afrin by the Turkish forces mm. at all. Mm. So, um, yes, that's... that's CIA support of indigenous peoples, and to me the Kurdish people are an indigenous people actually, um, has been systematic, it's structural, and you can understand it comes, it goes, mm. and never a, a reliable ally. No. Mm. 
I, I, to me, they, they don't taint. The Rojava administration has really tried to keep its integrity through all of the um, yes. incredible. I mean, in a way, like democracy was born in ancient Athens when Athens was under attack from Persia, from Sparta. Mm -hmm. So to me, actually, Rojava does offer a new model of democracy. That's, I mean, that's why Ojalan's books, um, The Quest for a Democratic Civilization, his big question is, will we actually evolve, develop to a state where we can actually say this is a democratic civilization? We haven't got there yet. Mm. And Rojava does give that hope, but it's, it's forged in the middle of war from all sides, from Turkey uh, especially, I, I from agree. Israel, from come on, ISIS yeah. especially, almost seems forged to destroy both the Syrian government and the Kurds. Yes, I, I do agree, but, uh, but the, um, the, there is a level of kind of compromise in the, with the sort of um, uh, input from the US and Trump, which, which makes it very hard to, to point to that example. At, at, for some audiences, for some people, um, it gives a, you know, it, it makes it problematic. But I do agree with you that there is a, a real, and particularly a real women-led aspect of Rojava. Um, but it's been overcome to some extent or overshadowed by the, the sheer horror of what's, uh, uh, of what's happening there. Um, just so much compromise. Yeah. Sure, but again, the, I think there's never been a war in history, and that's saying a lot, because every war involves propaganda. But I think... <laughs> This is the most propagandized war there has ever been. So, what we learn from the corporate media is a, a very, very, very distorted picture, I would say. Oh, of course it is, yes. Yeah. Any other questions or comments or interventions? Or something which we'd like Felix to elaborate on? Jacob has a question. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I work in the arts and humanities and I was wondering uh, how the intel agencies uh, impact the culture through the arts and in terms of manufacturing of consent. Um, uh -huh. my, my immediate experience with that was uh, working on a Turkish film during the Gezi Park protests and oh, ad-libbing yeah. on, ad on set in the scene and having the whole thing shut down going, you can't say that, you can't say that, you can't say that even yeah. though I was saying something that we just said off camera. And so the whole story of the art, the, the movie that we made, wouldn't make it past the censors, would get people in trouble. And so the yeah. story changed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's a, a very good example because I think Turkey, of all the countries I know, it is the most, the, the role of intelligence agencies has been most complex there almost because the, the degree of infiltration by initially maybe CIA backed or NATO allied forces. And that's why Gladio, the, the Gladio understanding of the NATO or CIA backed groups that were left in Europe after the Second World War to infiltrate, especially in Turkey. And some of the prime ministers, I think Ejevit in the 90s, 80s and 90s, he actually mentioned what we have is a gladio situation where the intelligence agencies are seeming to do one thing and I mean, like India, Turkey has a history of hundreds and hundreds of false flag attacks where the attacks are not what they seem. So Gezi Park, I, I was there a few weeks ago when I was on the delegation and um, yeah, what, what has happened there is, is a, I mean, Turkish and Kurdish journalists, activists, lawyers are some of the brave, bravest people I know. And in terms of being uh, in shelter in place, so many people are tuned to Netflix and to, and to, watching, uh, to watching the television and not just the news cycle, but our, our imaginative structures. And I'm just wondering how much the intelligences have an influence on the stories we watch the images that were shown, uh, well, who the enemy is? I mean, that, that's such an important question because if you look at, I mean, this, this book, and I, I'm hoping one of you is going to suggest a place where I can review it. His previous book, which 
I, I won't go and get it now, but it's called The Prehistory of the Computer. It's about, part one aspect is how children now, going into computer games, it is oppositional. Like there's a straight transition from playing computer games to operating a drone. Um, so, you know, and most of the, uh, so many computer games are, these are the bad enemies and you defeat them and it, there's no thinking about it. You're just a soldier out there to zap the enemy and win a glorious victory. So I think that thinking is so, so, so deep. And of course, there's many, many, many sophistications within that. Um, and I think, I, I suppose the main thing I want to say to all of you is just, let's be open about this. Like Chris was saying, let's not be afraid of them because they're human beings too. But um, we need to open their minds too. And we're all on this planet together. But let's really not be afraid to analyze these power structures and take on, not with great um, uh, polemics, but really to try to understand what is there and how it has been operating and how how we are controlled, each of us personally, how we are controlled by our machines, by our fears, and, and the, the fears that are manipulated now in the pandemic, the fears that have been manipulated for a long time. Thank I you. Wasn't, I wasn't quite, ex I wasn't, I know you're not saying this, but I wasn't quite saying let's be open to them and let's be nice to them and try and persuade, <laughs> persuade them. I wasn't really meaning that, I just meant let's not be too cowed uh, I mean, they'll only change when, they, when their own world starts falling apart. And you're quite right, there are now and again, amazingly, you just get these individuals who just feel the whole thing they thought they were fighting for is a complete criminal... Well, actually, men, there are many, many individuals, and they do, <laughs> yes. despite the that, dangers, that, they do... That, no, that is very important. There's nothing more valuable than, than winning over a turn, you know, agent. Uh, we, we also got to think about great novelists like Jean Le Carré, um, yeah. And yeah. You know, that this is like one of the greatest novelists since the war, yeah. uh, and and his whole landscape comes from out of this experience of, yeah. of intelligence. Yeah. 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 Um, we're, we're nearly uh, we've nearly reached eight o'clock, and our, my own view is it's best to end these things at a certain time rather than have people gradually yeah. drifting off. So unless there's somebody with a really urgent point. Um, I'm going to ask Camilla to, <laughs> and I'll say it myself, to thank um, Felix. Um, yeah. but, just to ask, um, Deb Yocci was asking for the author of The Struggle for Human Future. Jeremy Nadler. Right. Jeremy Nadler. That's yeah. right. It's nice when you put the, the, the books really close to the screen. That's, that's much better. We can see uh, it now. Yes. Yeah, so we're, we're hoping Felix is going to send this reading list and um, if you can't see it on Facebook, email Chris, if you know Chris's email, and he will have it. Okay. Okay. And I hope one of you will suggest somewhere where I can review this book. We will, yes. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe just put out a call. I mean, the only reason we stopped producing the Radical Anthropology Journal is just because it was getting just too much work, too much labour. We couldn't find any editors and co-editors. If, no, sure. if we've got anyone who's not a CIA agent or working <laughs> for, the, you know, for the GCHQ and who would like to um, sort of <laughs> tell us about themselves and maybe see if we can get a team together to r resurrect the journal, I would like nothing better um, than to get Radical Anthropology as a journal, probably a PDF rather than printed at least to start with. Um, yeah. but be, you, a, you did it as a PDF last time in 2013-14, I think, was it? Yeah, I mean, there, it, there's a couple of people on the chat giving lots of other good ideas, um, but perhaps they could contribute them on the reading list. They could add to the reading list at some point. Right. Um, to round up. Okay. okay. Wonderful. So, well, thank you so much because I think you know the anthropology, the radical anthropology group is has been quite a re revelation coming back to me. I know I've met you quite a few times over the years, and then I've been off the radar. Or you've been off the radar, so. It's very, very exciting to be in touch with all of you. Fantastic. Thank okay. you. Wonderful to hear from you. Thank you so yeah, much, you. Felix. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Great. I'm going to close that right. End meeting. End meeting.